Hi, my name is G. William Webb. I'm an artist based in New York. I wanted to say thank you to Brooklyn Clay for the opportunity to record my work. This is a view of my studio in Ridgewood, Queens. Um, I've been in this space for five years. Um, actually used to be a gallery, Regina Rex. Um, and when the gallery left um, the Ridgewood area, um, I came in with a few classmates of mine. I received my MFA from NYU, uh, where I was teaching intro to ceramics. And ceramics is a current throughout my work. I consider myself a sculptor and I'm using many materials. Um, but there's always some sort of thread of ceramics, which is something I'd like to talk about in my presentation. I wanted to bring this film into the talk because I think it's a good example of how I use various mediums to mediate uh, conversations of clay. And in this case, I have a 16 millimeter film. This is a three minute uh, duration film that at the time, around 2012, um, I was at the tail end of my graduate studies and I really wanted to um, get back to the fundamentals of what I was doing and what I knew how to do. And so, um, I thought of pottery as um, a way to uh, just kind of reflect on um, clay. And so uh, 16 millimeter was important because there was a sort of mirrored symmetry of the looping mechanism of the projector, which I liked, which was mirrored in the potter's wheel, which is mirrored in the clay. Um, which is mirrored in the symmetry of the hands. And so um, there's a sort of like fetish finish quality um, here and a real absurdity. And the entire film is just the, the manipulation of uh, the lip, which um, I think most potters would say is a sort of precarious uh, gesture in the pot, um, potentially risking losing the form. Um, but I was really interested in this shape, it's somewhat suggestive, and um, <clears throat> I wanted to read a bit of writing I had done at the time regarding this work. Time is held in the construction of a pot, not only the time taken to make the single form, but the entire history and learning of the potter preceding the single piece. This is all retained within the construction of a made thing. This is a collapse of time contained in form and experienced through weight, surface, and mark. Once the potter steps off the wheel and moves the work elsewhere, on the hand building table, perhaps, they carry their understanding with them. And this is kind of the idea of the world poem um, or some way of being an artist and that all the works uh, before the work we're currently making proceeds and goes into that piece. I wanted to show a few slides that um, incorporate some of the imagery and thought process uh, Marcel Duchamp, NASCAR. So Clay has been uh, with me um, for a long time. Uh, my family business um, throughout my entire life uh, is uh, racing cars on dirt ovals um, and you know, it's, uh, 
I think something that's unique, but not necessarily unique when you're raised with it. And so um, I didn't pay that much attention to it apart from it always being around me and um, childhood pictures of being at the track um, all the time. Um, but really what I grew to learn about uh, this process and um, working with my father who races these cars, which are very sculptural um, anyway, is the sort of melding of um, the machine, um, the person in the car and the dirt track. And so um, I'm very fascinated by these ideas of, um, at least in my work with clay, um, they have a very, mechanical uh, feel, my sculptures, um, but they're infused with the hand. Um, and for me, it's really engaging to the point at which the hand becomes mechanical in the work. Um, and so this is a aerial view of a track in uh, Marshalltown, Iowa. And we will get into slide of the work. This is a porcelain ring from 2012. It is extruded. Um, and I was really thinking back, um, it was around the same time as the 16 millimeter film. Um, kind of a meditation and focusing on this shape. And I was curious, um, I had heard artists talk about um, making works in which uh, you get to a certain point in resolving the piece where um, the artwork begins to tell you what it needs. And so this was definitely one of those cases where I began to see um, what that meant. And um, the surface quality here is um, unfixed. It is a chalk pastel that's rubbed into the bisque clay and the bisque itself I had um, sanded so it's hyper smooth finish. And um, yeah, the undulating form I thought gave the piece a live quality. Here's another work uh, photographed. I'm usually incorporating some sort of photographic process in the documentation of my sculpture. And an installation view, uh, incorporating the porcelain with other materials. Another installation view. This is from a group show in Brussels. I like the directness of putting the ceramics on the floor, but it's a little precarious. Ouroboros. Um, I wanted to read uh, a bit. I have um, in terms of things that are circular, which is a a thread in the work. Um, this is a writing uh, from Plato about uh, things that are circular. If it has no parts, it cannot have a beginning or an end or a middle for such things would be parts of it. Further, the beginning and end of a thing are its limits. Therefore, if the one has neither beginning nor end, it is without limits. When I was developing these uh, ring sculptures, I was really interested in something that is like so straightforward and seemingly so familiar. And I was curious if I could access the unfamiliar through the familiar. Um, and so just putting it out there, um, this particular work is ceramic um, made from a press mold and it measures around 22 inches uh, and sits on the wall. 
Um, it is a terracotta brick clay body and um, the surface quality is um, also similar to the pastel. This is a powdered pigment called Alverdin, which is a synthetic blood. Um, and I was curious of using this. Um, you'll notice the green coloration and the chemical that I was using, the Balverdin, is produced um, synthetically from Utah State University. And the green coloration is the same coloration that you would see in the halo around a bruise as it's healing. And so for me, this sculpture reflected uh, a bruise. This is um, a work in a collector's home cast from the same mold without the pigment on the surface. This is the raw clay body. And working with the form outside of ceramics, um, this is a seven foot extruded steel ring installed on Long Island um, and the finish is powder coated enamel um, that gives it a basically weather resistant and um, enables it to be outside and I liked pushing the scale and again thinking of these ideas of um, something being so familiar yet unfamiliar. And so I really see this as uh, a work that simultaneously frames the landscape and um, disappears. I produced the work twice. Um, this is installed in Randolph, Vermont, in front of a friend's church. Um, and we chose the location of the um, cast concrete pedestal where the Virgin Mary um, used to be. This is a sculptural work from 2016 using found and fabricated parts. The found elements in this sculpture are these um, asphalt, slugs, I would call them. Um, essentially, they were discarded from um, the roadside construction. And when I was able to do a little research, um, I found out that these segments are the byproduct of what the construction companies use. They bore the slugs out of the newly laid asphalt as a way of proving uh, the thickness of the road, which I imagine has to meet a certain standard. And so I took these forms um, here. I made a uh, sort of um, sedimentary stacking and bisected the work with a mirror finished disc. This thing is about um, 40 inches tall. And so um, I had like nine of those segments um, and the sculpture ended up leaving the studio, which was great. But before it left, I was able to cast um, one of the segments and produced a series of works using the same form and incorporating um, a clay body that I had repurposed um, using sediment from uh, a local construction site near the um, New York Bay uh, in uh, Industry City. And um, these are solid ceramic forms um, that are brought together with a laser cut steel track system that for me, unifies the piece. Um, I was living in the East Village at the time of making this work and spending a lot of time on the East River, <clears throat> just staring out um, and watching 
um, the barges come in from the port and really fascinated in the shape of the barge and particularly sourcing some of the brick material from the river. I wanted this piece to have a sort of a unified relationship with water. And so um, while the steel is uh, cohesively um, colored by being rust, um, similar to the terracotta brick. Um, I used a rapid rust process, which is an atmosphere I produced in the studio with the steel using white vinegar and peroxide to um, essentially create this very quickly produced rust um, that makes the work cohesive in terms of its tone and color. I really wanted it to appear as if they were one material. Um, this piece is called terra firma. Here on the left, we have a detail in black and white, how that mechanism works. Um, I was able to <clears throat> measure the brick and create the opening so that it rests just on top. Um, and then I created uh, some square formats with uh, a variety of um, other bricks. This piece also called terra firma <clears throat> is installed and shown here at a museum uh, group show in uh, Tucson at Mocha Tucson. They're kind of like simple machines. Um, give the impression that they could potentially be rolled away. And these are steelworks, also called terra firma. I think of these pieces as uh, moving images or infinite image generators in which um, the rollers move independently. And this piece is entirely modular um, using uh, a torch uh, to manipulate the surface of the steel. Um, it creates a sort of cascading um, appearance. And the thing I really liked about this um, when it came together is it simulates water. And so um, I would say that something I'm looking for in a piece is that it uh, simulates or is able to take on the characteristics that it traditionally as a material wouldn't be able to do. Um, and so while this is um, in a solid state as steel, um, it gave the um, impression through movement that it was actually uh, liquid. And I don't have a video here to show, um, but if you were in person with the work, um, it'd be able to, you'd be able to see more clearly what I mean. Um, back into some ceramics. Uh, these are terracotta um, bricks that I was um, essentially uh, interested in the brick form, but making it more of a point. And so uh, to produce these pieces, I was collecting some bricks and breaking them down as grog to incorporate into the clay body. And I was interested in the locality of each brick um, that I was finding recording this um, location, uh, usually around uh, where I'm living in New York City or near my studio and that by them being broken down into um, a powdered form that they lose uh, their sense of location, that location becomes uh, homogenized. And so when these bricks come together, they seem to be pointing towards their 
unknown origin. Um, this is a sculpture of 49 bricks that are also modular and can be um, stacked in different ways. The variation in coloration comes from the various bricks that I was mixing into the clay body, um, changes the uh, maturation um, point. Uh, and furthermore, you can see some of the uh, broken down brick here, a very laborious process um, done by hand. Uh, this is a terracotta sculpture I made uh, hand built and then transferred it to the potter's wheel to finish. Um, and I was really interested in making a clay sculpture that was made of a clay. Um, but simultaneously held itself within the sculpture. And so here we can see the opening in which um, I stuffed the vessel with uh, the broken down bits of clay. And um, really thinking about uh, what is a solid um, and questioning the sort of material stasis of the in interior of this vessel. installation view from a uh, group show. Now this is um, a form, a triangular brick uh, in two pieces that is made from adobe brick. Uh, I had a solo show in Tucson, Arizona and was working with a local adobe brick maker. Now adobe is around 30% clay. Um, the other materials uh, you use in adobe is some sort of like binding fiber like straw. Um, there's also sand and Adam who helped me uh, produce these works um, also incorporated about 8% of pulling concrete. <clears throat> and it's very brittle compared to a fired clay body, um, but it works in the desert, desert especially when um, these structures don't have exposure to uh, weather elements like um, intense wind or rain. And so, um, this is on the right, a picture from Adam, Adam's house. He um, produces the adobe brick and then um, kind of at a, a large scale and then is um, contracted to um, build homes uh, with the adobe. So it was exciting to work with him because <clears throat> he had the years of knowledge of working with Adobe in the area, but he didn't really have um, or bring a sort of artistic mindset to it. And so um, for us, it was nice to be able to collaborate. And for me, um, working with fabricators, I like there to be a sort of exchange, um, which is something that I, uh, I feel like was happening when I was working with my father on the race cars, that there was a, an exchange of being like, okay, these things are artistic and, um, and there's definitely a sculptural potential here, even though it might not be the immediate pursuit of the person working with that material. Um, so these Adobe bricks, uh, measure around 16 inches tall and that is deliberate um, because uh, the material weight of these pieces is nine pounds and um, this is a tetramorph uh, an image of um, four spirits um, and in tradition um, a tetramorph would be um, sort of four elements of a thing that come together to make one unit. And so I wanted to take um, this concept of uh, a triangular brick measuring nine pounds. <clears throat> and I think of nine pounds as being um, 
sort of referential uh, to um, like the weight of a newborn baby or something like the um, John Henry uh, folk legend of the nine pound hammer. And so um, using uh, steel, um, I produced a work in 2016 um, that was cast steel. And this was around the time of the 2016 election and there was a lot of uh, campaigning happening in the US around the idea of revitalizing the Rust Belt. And I became curious about what it meant to turn something rusted into a non-rusted material and what that actually means. Um, and so uh, a typical art foundry is not going to um, melt steel for you. Um, art metals such as um, bronze or aluminum are a much lower melting point. Uh, but steel is closer um, to being over 3,000 degrees. And so I found a foundry in Kelowna, Iowa called Max Cast. Um, they're in this Amish community. It's really strange to go. You'll see the, um, the farmers in horse and buggy, and then you pull into the foundry and they're melting steel in these like crazy silver suits. Um, but essentially what it takes to make something rusted, unrusted, uh, which I learned through this process is um, you have to sandblast the um, steel to remove the impurities of the rust and then heat the metal up in the crucible to 3000 degrees. So here um, I'm using various um, pieces of metal um, and really curious about the uh, material histories that I'm putting into the form. Um, they're being heat up, heated up and homogenized in a way that's very similar to the brick pieces that were um, homogenized bricks and poured into um, uh, a sand cast. And this is the finished form. These two brick wedges also weighing nine pounds. The material weight of this form um, requires that the piece is around 10 and a half inches tall. And I made the work a third time. This is polystyrene styrofoam. Um, and because of the material density and weight of uh, this work, the nine pound segments ended up being over eight feet tall. This is shown uh, in St. Louis. Playing around with um, showing these works here, the steel is cantilevered off of the wall using a very strong magnet. Here we see on the left a texture of the adobe and um, this is a wax version on the right next to the steel. And the wax that measures around 22 inches tall. So these all carry the current uh, being shared with the, the weight, the nine pounds. <clears throat> so after not too long, um, I was getting a little worn out, uh, breaking down so much brick. Um, and I had to think about a way to use the same ideas, but in a different form. And so this idea of finding a brick, tracing its locality, 
and really fixing the brick into a new form. Whereas before I was able to break down the brick into a material that could be worked into the clay body. Here I'm physically locking these found bricks into new clay forms. Um, and what I like is that it enables me to still preserve the brick more or less in its original state. And so um, I was interested in using a square format for these sculptures, um, which I call step wells. So the square format I was able to achieve by simply breaking the brick in half and then um, really measuring the clay form so that I can accommodate the shrinkage and the bottoms of these sculptures are sealed. And so when I'm building them using a slab roller and a ruler, um, I'm leaving about three quarters of an inch around the entire brick so that when I put the lid on, it's closed. And then I fire these, they're low fire clay bodies. Um, the shrinkage more or less um, encloses the, the found brick. And I think of these as like twice baked potatoes, um, kind of jokingly, because uh, there was, the sort of initial fear of putting a brick immediately into the kiln and seeing what happens, um, especially because um, I discovered through breaking down all these bricks that bricks are made of a lot of different things and uh, there's a lot of crap in there. Um, but I could trust at least that um, these bricks had been through one firing and that they could make them make it through another. They're kind of like sagger boxes a bit. So um, this is an image of a step well in India. These communal um, pieces of architecture that are used to gather water. And um, I was making my brick boxes and a friend came into the studio and um, told me about these uh, sites and I thought it was a really beautiful concept and beautiful form. And um, I actually um, liked the reference to water as a current throughout the work um, and, uh, and thought it was a very poetic idea, these step wells. So here on the left, um, it's a variety of uh, brick boxes. On the right, uh, we have some very early brick boxes in which I was um, working through, figuring out the form, figuring out proportions. So these are more like um, brick baskets. Uh, but for the brick boxes, um, what I like and now that I have a collection of them is that they make uh, a sort of mapping of um, my movement through the, through, through the city. And this is, um, I think, in part due to um, the locality of where I'm picking up the bricks. And so I like to record the location of each brick and scribe that on the bottom of the um, brick box so that it is um, able to circulate as um, a discrete art object, um, but still has this fixed locality. And for me, that's um, similar to the material histories that I'm putting when I'm, I'm using reclaimed materials, say, for example, in the um, melted down steel sculptures. Um, so this a collection of brick boxes becomes a sort of um, conceptual uh, line drawing uh, or map um, of my movement through New York City. Was in St. Louis for a wedding in January and I 
um, have an upcoming show in St. Louis and uh, for the exhibition, um, I wanted to do a piece that was referential of St. Louis. And so I found a brick and this brick was rectangular, solid, um, and I cut it into four parts. And um, I call this piece a point which weighs, um, it's a work in progress. This is uh, a view of the brick itself, which um, I used uh, a saw to cut into four quarters, which make triangular shapes. And then working on making four triangular brick boxes. Um, you can see the darker brown clay body. These are still um, yet to be fired. They're in the greenware state. And the orange um, piece is the finished and fired uh, brick box. So um, really playing with the form of the brick at this point, um, but this will be a four part sculpture. Uh, the lighter brown sculpture on the far right is uh, um, one of the first ones I made just playing around with the, uh, the, the format of the triangular box. Um, but this piece will be uh, four parts and um, I'm excited to uh, see it come together. Another view. And here's a studio view of uh, the works together. Um, all right. So um, it's April 13th. We are uh, here in Randolph, Vermont. Um, I left the city three weeks ago uh, to quarantine and retreat in Vermont. Uh, my friends have a church in Randolph. Um, and as the uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, was happening, uh, felt like I had to get out of the city um, as soon as I could. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, hard to leave the city behind um, and particularly being outside of the studio um, started asking these questions of you know what does it mean to have a instead of a post studio practice a postponed studio practice in the COVID-19 era um, and so I just wanted to use part of this lecture first of all saying thank you to all the first responders, all the nurses, and the people who um, are on the front lines um, taking care of this pandemic um, really recognize that it's a privilege to be able to make art during this time and to be thinking about art ideas. Um, but I wanted to propose um, what a studio practice can be, what a postponed studio practice could be in the COVID-19 era. Um, this is a photograph of a sleeping dog I took in um, Turkey. Views of the church where I'm at. It's a Catholic church um, decommissioned from 1905. Uh, very creative space. Very lucky to be here. Um, so partly without having ceramic materials, my kiln or uh, any tools, I've been making a lot of bread. Um, there's a lot of similarities between sourdough and clay bodies. The sort of observation that's required and attention. Um, thought this was funny last night, a New York Times article about these 500 year old pieces of uh, dough um, that are in the shape of my sculptures. Taking nature hikes. 
in a postponed studio practice. Thinking about geology, here's some uh, drawings of um, till, which I thought were really great, almost like a geometric abstraction, um, but really um, find myself in Vermont and all of a sudden I'm a Vermont artist. So, um, seeking out uh, natural clay bodies in the area and uh, during these nature rocks, um, really trying to uncover uh, what's happening. And so um, I came upon this uh, type of earth sediment called varv, which is essentially a combination of sand, till and clay. Um, and this is a photo I found online, but it shows the, um, sedimentary qualities and um, almost like the rings of a tree trunk. This is the um, annual sediment um, from the various seasons. The darker sediment is uh, from the winter and lighter is from summer that um, make up a lot of the ice melt that was happening when the glaciers receded in this area. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Brooklyn Clay.